Hey guys, Greg here, let's solve climbing stairs, lead code number 70. Okay, so you are climbing a staircase and it takes n steps to reach the top. Each time you can either climb one or two steps. In how many distinct ways can you climb to the top? So if n is equal to two, then there's actually two ways to get to the top. You could either take one step and then take another one step, or you could immediately take two steps. So there's two distinct ways of getting to the top. And if n is equal to three, then there's actually three ways to get to the top because you could either take one step, then one step, then one step, or you could take one step and then you could take two steps, or you could start with two steps and then take one step. So that would be three distinct ways ways. Now let's keep it simple for now. Let's say we had just one step to climb. So that would basically mean we're right here and you would have one step to climb and you would be located at the top. So there's one step to climb and there's really only one way to get to the top because you would have to just do one step. So if n is equal to one, then there's simply one way to get to the top and that would be considered a base case. Okay, your other base case is if n is equal to two. So this situation stays exactly the same, but we add another step. So to climb to step number two, well, there's actually going to be two ways to get here because you could either do one to get here and then do another one to get here, or you could kind of skip this step and just climb immediately two to get here. So there's two ways to get here. So if n is equal to two, that's basically another base case that there's two ways to get to the top. Okay, more generally, if n is equal to three, then we have three steps. Well, there's actually three ways to get here because you could start at the beginning and do one, then one, then one, or you could do one and then two, or you could do two and then one. Now, if n is equal to four, it's starting to get a little complex here. So let's think about this more algorithmically. Well, if we are to get here, how are we getting there? Well, we're getting there from either here or or from here because you can't take three steps. We're definitely not getting there from here. So if there's two ways to get here and there's three ways to get here, well, then there's actually five different ways to get here. So if there's two ways to get here, well, then you could get here in those distinct ways and then you could just jump immediately to there. And if you were to get here, well, there's three ways to do that. So you could do those three different ways to do that and then just take one step. So basically you'll see it after this one here at n is equal to five. So if we had five steps that we had to climb, there's five ways to get here. There is three ways to get here. And so there's going to be the sum of the previous two values, aka eight ways to get there. Now note that this is basically a Fibonacci sequence because you have your base cases at basically f of one is equal to one and f of two is equal to two. And from there, basically the next part of the sequence is simply just the sum of the previous two values. So the sum of those previous two is always going to give you that next result. So now that we've essentially reduced this to the Fibonacci problem, by the way, if you haven't seen my video on Fibonacci, make sure you check that out right now. I'm going to explain that in much more depth than I do here. But basically there's four different things you can do for a Fibonacci. The first one is your naive recursive program. So that's basically just writing the sequence exactly as it is. That's a little bit slow because there's overlapping sub problems and you'll get big O of two to the n for your time there. The second way is basically optimizing this with a cache and remembering function calls. So you can do a top down dynamic programming, which basically means memoization, just using a cache to remember function calls, that'll get the time down to O of n. Something a little preferable is bottom up dynamic programming, because that is going to use tabulation. And you can make that table or basically the array uh, without using recursion, you can use for loops for that. And that is also going to be O of n time, but it's just generally faster in programming languages. And the last way to do it, which since this is a Fibonacci, this is not always the case. But as you'll see, we actually don't really need to store all of your array here. If you kind of picture these numbers as like the array that you're building here, uh, you don't really need to store that because the next value is always just going to be the sum of the previous two. So that's basically what we call a bottom up constant space approach. And that is going to not really build a table, it just uses two variables and that's going to be O of n time, and the space complexity of that is going to be big O of one, whereas the space complexity for all of these three, those were all O of n. So I'm just gonna code up all of those solutions in a row. 
Okay, so the recursive solution is really easy. If n is equal to one, that's a base case. There's simply one way to do that. If n is equal to two, there's two ways to get up it. You can either do one and then one, or you could just do two. So we'd return two ways to do that. And otherwise, n is at least three. And so you have to use a recursive solution to solve this. You could do return the self. You have to call self because this functions in a class. Self dot climb stairs on n minus two plus self dot climb stairs on n minus one. It's just saying that the current value is the number of ways we can get to two steps back plus the number of ways we can get one step back. So if you run this, this will definitely work. I'm not sure if it passes the test cases. Okay, it's too slow for the test cases because this time complexity is going to be big O of two to the N because of those overlapping sub problems. You're basically calling the function several times, even for the same value. If that doesn't make sense, please watch Fibonacci and the space complexity of this due to the recursive call stack is going to be big O of N. Okay, the way to memoize this is basically to put this in a helper function. So we can define what's basically a Fibonacci. So we'll literally call it define f of n. And so now if we kind of indent all of this stuff and replace this with simply f of n minus two and this on f of n minus one, well, we can make a cache. So we'll call it memo is a dictionary. And we'll say, hey, instead of our base cases here, if n is in the memo, so if n is in the memo and we should put our base case cases in the memo. So if n is one, the result is one way to get there. And if there's two steps, then there's two ways to get there. So if n is in the memo, aka if it's a base case, or we've already called this function on this value of n before, then if n is in the memo, just return memo at n. And otherwise, what you'd want to do is put that in the memo. We're going to put memo at n equal to that result. And then we can return memo at n because now it's in there. This brings the time complexity all the way down to big O of n. You just need to actually return the result of this. So return the result of f at n. And by the way, if it makes you more comfortable, you could change this n here to be x, but the way that Python works, it doesn't really matter. So we can return that. And that is going to pass the test cases because it's significantly faster. Okay, so this is your top-down memoization. And now we're going to do the bottom-up dynamic programming approach, which is often called tabulation. So we're basically building up a table of values. And the time and space of that will also be O of n. So let's just rewrite this whole thing here. Again, it's useful to get your base cases. If n is equal to one, then you would return one. If n is equal to two, then you would return two. Otherwise, we need to build up a table and you generally call that table DP. So DP is going to be an array of, at first they'll just be zeros. So we're just allocating space for the array and it's going to need n many positions. And at the end, you'd want to return DP at n minus one. Now, if you did recently watch Fibonacci, this is probably gonna to look ever so slightly different based on the array positions, basically because Fibonacci is defined as f of zero is zero and f of one is one. However, this is basically off by one. This is that basically f of one is one and f of two is two. Okay, so you would establish your base cases in here, set dp at zero equal to one and set dp at one equal to two. Then we need to go through all of the array positions necessary, which is going to be for i in the range of two up until n. This is n exclusive. So this is saying the first index we're going to modify is two, basically the third spot, because you know the third step is the first one we actually create this table for. And then we're going up until the last position of n minus one. And that makes sense here because if you have n positions in the array, well then the last index should be n minus one. We would always set dp at i to be dp at i minus two plus dp at i minus one. This is just saying that the current value is going to be the sum of two steps back plus one step back. Again, in this steps conversation, it's saying the number of ways to get here is the number of ways we could get two steps back plus the number of ways we could get one step back. And then after that, we can just return the final array position that we created, which you could either do dp at negative one or what I write here is dp at n minus one to really obviously say that that's the last position of the array. If you were to run that, that's going to take up the same time and space. Uh, it says it's slower, but it should be faster if n actually gets large. It turns out here n is actually limited to 45. So it's kind of random in this case. Okay. And because this is Fibonacci, it turns out you can actually do this in a way without creating the table. So you can do a bottom up constant space approach where you basically just use two variables. These base cases are fine, but what we would do is we would set prev equal to 
to the first way, which is one, and cur equal to the second step, which is two. So same thing following our base cases here. And then we just iteratively set prev and cur to be cur and prev plus cur. So what that does here is sets prev always gets updated to cur. So that makes it always one step behind cur. And cur is going to be just prev plus cur. So it's saying that the next value is going to be the sum of the previous two values. And again, if you haven't seen Fibonacci or that's a little weird, I explain that in a lot more detail in the Fibonacci video. Okay, the only other thing here would be returning our final value, which would just be cur. This is going to bring the time to O of n, the space to O of one. And this is the best solution you could come up with for an interview. Technically for Fibonacci, there is a log n way of using basically Binet's formula, which uses a power. It's really not worth it. And technically it's a lot faster, but it's just very silly for interviews. So I hope this was helpful, guys. Drop a like if it was and have a great day. Bye-bye.